<laughs> Where did you hear that? Because I've only spoken about that like once probably online. Yeah, I can't tell you because then, you, <laughs> then you'll know what else I'm going to come with. I actually found in my old emails from maybe July 2015. Congratulations, Simon Cabinet, you've opened your live account on Trading212. I'm a 15 year old. You know what I mean? Understanding how the markets work and being able to call the next move means very, very little. Execution is absolutely everything. I don't like to do things in half measures. I like to go all out. I got banned from PayPal for life because I was like 16, 17 year old and getting, you know, 8,000 pounds in payouts in two, three days. Trading deserves the bad rap that it has, not because of trading itself, but because of the majority of people who have the loudest voice within it. In this industry, in my industry, you take money from the people who aren't prepared to put in the work that you are. Everything I do in life is done in service to God. What we see in society is as we've moved away from God's order, society begins to collapse. I loved money. I would still have called myself a Christian at that time, but I wasn't, you know, I was Sam, welcome to the show. I feel this one's been in the pipeline for a long time. Yeah, man. Happy to be here. And when I was thinking about where to start this, I think the obvious point for me is back in 2015, your first encounter with the Trading 212 app. I want to understand what was life like back then? <laughs> you just saying that, like, it, it shows me obviously how much like research and all that kind of stuff you do into it. Um, because I don't, where, where did you hear that? Because I've only spoken about that like once probably online. Yeah, I can't tell you because then, you, then you'll know what else I'm going to come with. Right, okay. So I'm in school and I have not really any idea what I want to do with my life. But I'm watching like fitness YouTubers. I was really big into like CG fitness and all these kind of people. All the Just on that, have you seen how Guzman looks just now? No. I think he's gone a bit too far on the GH and stuff like that. Really? I actually saw a few videos talking about, oh, it's a shame he's how unwell he is. But seeing that era, what an inspiration to so many young guys. Well, I mean, we can get into that. But I did see a video a few months ago where he was like, he was um, vlogging himself and he was Very like quite jittery. shaky and all that kind of stuff. Something to do Adderall apparently, some sort of yeah, addiction, yeah. People people were, were talking about that. But he was a massive inspiration. I mean, I remember when the i8 had only just kind of... I mean, we're talking about a European car in, in America. That's already already big, but the i8. And there was just this drone shot of him driving in the i8. And that's when I knew I wanted one, right? But I was really inspired by all the kind of Gymshark guys, Ogus and all that. And I was watching like maybe a, a Christian Guzman video or whatever. And the advert for Trading 2 on 2 came up and it was like, trade 10,000 pounds for free. <clears throat> and I thought, okay, you know, I'll download this. And I was just sitting on my phone you know, trading stocks, trading Apple, Microsoft, whatever, from my phone at the lunch table at school. And all your mates kind of being like, oh, what are you doing there? And, you know, they can see you're making money and all that. And in all honesty, just the kind of general hype around it began to, to really pique my interest when I saw how interested other people were in it. People were like, oh, that's so cool. And Creates an element of status to some extent. Yeah. yeah, perhaps. You know, you're 15-year-old and you don't know what you want to do. And here's this thing. And I just, I just kind of rolled with that. What were those early days like then? What were you, what were you experiencing when you were opening the app? You were playing with ten thousand pounds on a demo account, I would imagine. Ten thousand pounds money that you know most teenagers are never going to see. So although it's demo money, it's fake money. There is that element of like, I mean, it's monopoly money, right? But there is that element of you've got ten grand sitting there, and as anybody knows who trades on a demo account or a practice account, you win you always win on, on like a demo account because there, you have no r true risk exposure. You have no true attachment to that money. So you can let a position go 2000, you know, in the red and then recover and be 500 in the green and close it. And you've just made 500 quid. So that's exactly what it was like. And um, I mean, that did wear off when I, I ended up going to college to do architecture and that kind of thing. But trading was always kind of somewhere in the background it was happening during that time so while you maybe focused on architecture potentially going to be the career you still had this interest in trading was there a period during that time when you decided to go live away from like the the demo towards like actually trading your own money yeah so there was a point in 2015 where i actually opened a live account i don't know how you know to be fair regulation and that kind of thing wasn't quite what it is today. ESMA regulations on leverage and all that kind of stuff hadn't come in yet. And I'd managed to open a live account. I actually found in my old emails from maybe July, 2015, you know, congratulations, Simon Cabinet, you've opened your live account on trading to and to. I'm a 15 year old, 
you know what I mean? Now, I don't remember if I was ever able to fund it, you know, perhaps on my mum's credit card or something like that. I don't actually remember. But what I do remember is because I have the email, I did open a live account. Um, but my first memory of actually trading live was probably when I was 17 or 18. It was probably a little bit later. A little bit later down the line. What enabled you to go live then in terms of like, were you learning? Were you researching? What was enabling you to maybe have the confidence to this time around be like, right, I'm going to put some real money in here? Yeah, I didn't have to get the confidence because you're a young guy. Young guys are are arrogant. Young guys think they know everything. And this is the kind of con of demo or practice money is because you can make money on a demo account relatively easily, it instills you with that confidence that, okay, I'm just going to do what I've been doing here on the live funds. And I think what kind of re-sparked my interest was the rise of all these kind of online gurus that I'd seen on Instagram, you know, flexing their, you know, financed mercs and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, oh yeah, trading, like I know how to do that type of thing. It was always there in the back of my mind. And I ended up, you know, going the route that most people do. I joined one of these sort of signals groups and that kind of thing. And, um, you know, I saw these guys seem to be making money and I thought I could do it too. I wanted to try and follow along with them, realized that wasn't, you know, um, there was no reality to it and ended up going and pursuing my own education, finding courses online, paying mentors and that kind of thing. During that period where you were trying the signals, you said the flashy scenes that you saw on Instagram with people getting success from that wasn't the reality. What was the reality? The reality is you join one of these groups, you pay, you know, you put three, 400 quid into a brokerage account, you join the group for free. In reality, the broker pays a quite a healthy commission to those um, influencers, if you like. And so they make, you know, three, 500 quid off of each person they get to sign up. They send you a load of trades just to get you to trade a specific amount of volume so that you qualify with the brokerage for them to get a commission. A referral fee. Yeah. That's all it is. It's just a big, it's just a big scam. Yeah. How did that feel then for you to go through that process? <sighs> I mean, I, we you're spoke, so experienced now. Yeah, knowing what you know now, how do you reflect on that? I wouldn't change it for the world, um, because it's it's why I am where I am today. You need to go through those negative experiences. How when someone comes to me and says they've been burned in the markets, how can I empathise with that if I've not been there already myself? So it also, yeah, it's it's just an experience I wouldn't change. There's nothing I I can't look back in anything in my life and say, oh, I wish I could change that. I I'm just not that that person, you know. Yeah, but so during that period, what kind of money were you putting into these signal groups for you to see how it went? I was running another business at the time, Tactical Com Solutions, which you know maybe we get onto um, at some point in the interview. But I was running that business and I was funneling money from that into trading at the time as well. But around this time, I was starting to tighten up on risk management and that kind of thing. Friends, you know, um, were also giving me money to trade. And we were, I was kind of trading a combined pot, you know, I'm like 17, 18 year old, shouldn't be doing that. But that's that's what I was doing. So I was, I was building up a bit of a, a pot of capital. I say building up a pot of capital, we're maybe talking like five grand and, and just trading that. But I'm trading on super tight risk management. I'm not profitable yet. But I'm maybe down, you know, a couple hundred quid on the overall account or something like that. Could you see what your methodology was going to become, or could you see ways or trends that were pointing to becoming a profitable trader? I've always had an unshakable confidence um, that I was, which, you know, comes from there was a naivety there, understanding how the markets work, and being able to call the next move means very, very little. Execution is absolutely everything. You know, execution is 100% of trading. You can have, this is why funds, you know, have analysts, you know, they have all the people who do the research, fundamental, technical, um, and then they have their risk management department, and then they have their traders. What do the trader, what's the trader do? He just executes the trade, you know, that the other parties have, have put together and, and got approval for. So as a someone who's trading your own funds, you need to be risk management department, fundamental technical analysis, and the trader and the and the fund manager. People who can execute aren't always the people who can come up with good ideas and the people who come up with good ideas aren't always people who can execute. In trading, and this is why, you know, for your average retail trader, something like 10% of all retail traders make money because you have to, you have to possess some of the skills of all of those departments in order to trade successfully. 
And so although I had a grip of all of these different areas, the actual execution was was seriously lacking and that showed in, in negative results. In the results. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's so interesting. And I think one of the most interesting things is you brought up the fact that you had this other business. Tell me about Airsoft and how you came to, to build this. Yeah, so I fell in love with action sports Little little kids, right? They're into guns and you know, you find sticks and you're shooting each other with sticks and all that kind of stuff. I used to build, I've always had a bit of a I don't know what you would call this, you know, not not like an inventor, but I've always been quite industrious. I used to build guns um that, that would actually fire projectiles when I was a kid. So I'd get like a bit of let's say two by four and I'd have a wooden peg on the end of it, which I would tape down or tie down to the to the end of the this two by four. And then I would take, you know, those metal springs from the inside of pegs that would clip into the peg, rubber band around it, which would stretch over the end of the two by four. And to fire it, you would just release a peg. And so what it would do is the rubber band would sling this metal projectile at, you know, ridiculous speeds. You would get those big thick rubber bands that the postman would drop, you just follow them around, pick them up. And I mean, you could put holes in glass windows with, with with these peg guns. And so that's what I used to do. You know, I used to build guns when I was like maybe six, seven year old, running around my parents' garden, shooting at things, you know, breaking things. I was I was nuts. And I guess my parents decided, okay, we're, we're maybe going to find somewhere to vent this. They ended up booking me a paintball for my birthday. Wasn't realistic enough for me. You know, I wanted, I wanted a bit more realism. Ended up finding Airsoft and kind of pursuing that, which into my early teens i wanted to pursue a bit more of a a, a really high quality professional level, level yeah. competitive level ended up joining a team in my kind of mid to late teens sterling airsoft they run some of the biggest events in in the world really milsim events a lot of their guys are ex special forces ex military instructors and that kind of thing got asked to do their selection process which is a scaled down version of the special forces uk special forces selection process very intensive three-day event you know pass rates typically not that great i'm one of the youngest people to pass it passed it on my first my first goal i trained hard for it um and so i, I took that stuff seriously you know but i think i think just based on the personality type that i've got to know so far you are someone that when he has a focus on something it becomes of high importance to you and a lot of other things would maybe go to the wayside in order for you to prioritize this i don't like to do things in half measures i like to go all out um and everything that i do i can't remember who it was said it to me it was maybe my dad said you know if a if a job's worth doing it's worth doing right and i apply that to everything you know whether it be you know let's say i wanted to start a podcast or something like that i would i would be getting the best equipment i'd be finding the best locations i'd be finding the best guests and you know i think that's where we we kind of relate you know me and richard relate quite well when you find people like that who don't just want to dip their toes in the water if they want to even try something they're going to try it with full throttle you know the term polymath no so polymath is somebody that's like brilliant across such a wide range of things and sometimes people are like oh you're really good at this 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 and i'm like yes but that's all <clears throat> there's nothing outside of that put me put me go-karting terrible put me at golf good put me at um training in the gym pretty good put me at doing some sort of combat sport i'm pretty bad but i'm trying to get better yeah. but I, w things that you turn your attention to i'd much rather go narrow and deep than wide and shallow it doesn't interest me to maybe do an activity every six weeks and be terrible at it and get no positive feedback loop or no level of progression and i think again that's why we probably resonate with each other in terms of the things that you spend your time on you you try and create an element of mastery and that feels great yeah absolutely absolutely um i would always be that guy you know you go to an airsoft game and it's like i would see the people who were kind of that best team and i'm like how how do i become part of that and i would i would go through the necessary channels to get there and so as I was the youngest guy on on Sterling, you know, Sterling, not as in Sterling, Sterling, but Sterling as in David Sterling, the founder of the SAS. Um, Sterling Airsoft was initially Sterling Services. They were a close protection company. Back before there was a lot of legislation around that, they do close protection for, you know, armed close protection for um, ambassadors of different nations and political people of importance they do work overseas in afghanistan iraq and all that serious kind of operators thing. yeah and when all the regulation and stuff started to come in on private military contracting uh, early 2000s 
they began to transition into running these experience events, which they would do with airsoft guns. And that they ended up becoming a airsoft events company and they are now one of the most prestigious and their kind of core team founded by John McAleese, who was actually one of the um, first people through the window in the Iranian embassy siege. So Starlink Services was founded by John McAleese and a good friend of mine, Matt Belgrove. And after John Mac died and they really fully pivoted into Airsoft in order to maintain uh, John Mac's kind of the way he had his kind of legacy and that kind of thing, they said, well, look, we are run these events and anyone can pay to come along. But if you want to be part of our team, you have to go through some version of a selection process, just like John Mack would have done, just like a lot of the guys had done for their military careers. They're basically saying, if you want to compete alongside us, you need to show that you're willing to, to be at a certain standard. Now, most people look at that and they go, it's a game and it is a game. But in every game, you can take things to the nth degree. When you see people in a chess, you know, uh, chess grandmasters and they're sweating or the guy loses and he's like crying on the floor or something like that, you go, it's just a game. These people want to be the absolute upper echelon in that, in that realm. It was no different in Airsoft. And, you know, to get onto how that kind of relates to the antenna business, communication was a, a problem for us. Military radios are a regulated um you know it's a regulated item um in the sense that you you can't just go and buy military radios the same with night vision and all that kind of stuff we had different channels we would go through to obtain these types of things but the radios we would use they they couldn't communicate effectively over long distances and so i decided to develop an antenna because at your events the spaces were vast and you were Huge. trying to communicate to run it was like it's a military simulation event yeah. was not so so we would We'd be running, you know, we'd be doing an event in Carwen in Wales, an old uh, RAF base in Wales that was designed during World War II. <clears throat> and, I mean, the area of operation is like miles, miles squared. You can't communicate effectively with, you know, your forward operating base or zero or command or whatever without having the right antennas and that kind of thing. So I developed out of a tape measure my dad worked construction and um, you know most of my life i developed out of a tape measure uh, an antenna that could collapse down and fold up and when you let it go it would spring up and so i sanded this down i soldered in antenna connections covered it in black heat shrink the whole the whole lot and made something look relatively presentable posted it on facebook in one of these groups i was in people went nuts for it you know before you know it, i've got like 50 people waiting in my dms trying to buy one and that's where that business came from you know, so and it accelerated really quick as well. It did. I, I got banned from PayPal for life because I was like 16, 17 year old and getting, you know, 8,000 pounds in payouts in two, three days. PayPal are it like- It gets flagged immediately. Yeah, exactly. So it was- We don't like things to be entrepreneurial in this country sometimes. Or sorry, PayPal is a global organization as well. I'll never be able to use PayPal. Oh my goodness. Maybe I get an alias for that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I find I find I find it remarkable though how you probably demonstrated some of your entrepreneurial spirit at that age, and everyone can always link back to oh at thirteen I was hustling and doing a paper round, and with the paper round money I was buying this and taking it to a garage sale, and that's really cool to sometimes reflect back. But when you look at you identifying a problem in an area that you cared about and building a business out of it, it probably served you really well because I've heard you say before that the capital that you got from that business was something that allowed you to trade without maybe some of the same pressures as somebody who was only relying on trading as an income if that makes sense yeah absolutely and this is the thing about trading finance investing regardless of what anyone says on a month to month or quarter to quarter basis it's not a stable or reliable source of income now people hear that and they go what trading is not a, a reliable source of income not on a month to month basis on a year to year basis absolutely but on a month to month basis it's not I can't tell you if I'm going to be, you know, up or down money next month in the markets. So having trading as a sole source of income, it will more than, you know, on a profitable month, if you're trading the right amount of capital, you can do five figures, right? Quite easily. So that's going to last you for a good few months of negative anyway. But I want to be cash flow positive every month. And so if cash flow positivity is something that you're looking for as a reliable source of income, you need to have multiple streams of income. And having a 
having TCS, which was my previous business, having that whilst I was learning to trade meant I was cash flow positive every month. There was no pressure on me to generate profits out of the market immediately. Um, but I was still pursuing excellence in it. So for some people, they need their back up against the wall in order to perform. I don't, I just don't. If I'm interested in something, I'm going to master this. You know, I could have been making a million pounds a month from TCS. I'd still be seeking mastery in trading, even if it was only making me 50 quid a month, just because I want to be in that top 10%. It lit a fire for you. And awareness of how you are wired is something that I am so so bullish on and like understanding what your personality traits are and leaning into those strengths while recognizing some of those weaknesses and maybe working on those and when you have a natural predisposition for hard work dedication focus go towards it don't run away from it and if you channel in the right areas which i'm, I'm sure we're going to get onto those areas of your life that were, were not as channeled as, as, as they could have been and they maybe are now it's really really rewarding when you have that focus on building this business but guess what on the side I'm creating something that could be so, so different and look what it's built for you now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If we go back to TCS then, what kind of revenue figures were coming in that allowed you to maybe scale your trading business or trading, the amount of trading that you were doing? So I was very into streetwear when I was a teenager and Supreme, the way Supreme used to operate is they'd have seasons. And during those seasons, they would do a drop every Thursday at like 11 a.m. UK time. They would drop stock and it would sell out like that. So what am I going to do? I'm just going to model after what they did, what they done. Created a scarcity. I know nothing about marketing. I'll be honest with you. You know, in, in school, I was physics, chemistry, you know, graphics, history, yeah. English, you know. Building things out of tape measures and yeah, <laughs> absolutely wild. So I'm like, I'm into all of the, like, I guess it's like STEM fields, right? You know, just fulfill my gender roles because I'm just so based. Um, but no, so I was never into like marketing or business or anything like that. But when I look back on the way I ran TCS, I would do a drop every month, every other month rather. I would drop stock. There's 50 of this antenna available and they'd sell out in a day. And I would spend the next eight weeks, you know, I would produce those. I, they were always on, always on back order. So people would pay up front. I'd produce them within eight weeks. So it'd get sent to them. And so people are like desperate for them to drop. They sell out almost immediately and then they have to wait like eight weeks to get them. And then, you know, they drop again, people get in and it's just like this constant cycle. And so there was always a scarcity. And so I was just able to keep putting the price up, developing the product a little bit, putting the price up. I was able to use some of the software that I had got from college when I was studying architecture to design set files for the steel. So now instead of buying tape measures and cutting them up and preparing them myself, I could go directly to the company in China who produced the steel for Stanley tape measures and all that kind of stuff. And before it's got paint on it, before it's got markings on it, here's a set file, cut the bottoms like this, cut the top like this, produce me 50. And so a company in China, Wintape, who produced all the steel for Stanley, etc., they had a section of their factory set up just for TCS and they would produce steel for me, set amount of steel they would send me, you know, every couple of months and I would produce these antennas. I'm in, my, in a bedroom in my parents' house, you know, um, and and ship them out and and that's that's the way it ran yeah what was your mindset like when you saw those figures and that amount of income coming into your bank the first time i had a thousand pounds in my bank account i sent a screenshot to neve on facebook messenger and we were like a thousand pounds you know it was it was crazy it struck you as like did you like what was the buzz like i guess in terms of understanding <clears throat> what that feeling was like so my my parents both grew up working class. You know, my mum grew up in a mining village in Edinburgh. My father grew up, you know, in the outskirts of Dublin, rough area, working class, you know, big, big Catholic family and that kind of thing. Um, so that that was always, always the way it was. They've always had that working class mentality. My dad actually done pretty successful, uh, pretty well, sorry, in his in his career. He ended up being a manager of a chemical plant in Edinburgh, which he gave up in the late 90s. They wanted to send him to America. We moved through to Glasgow in the early 2000s into a small working class town in a council estate in an ex-council house. And my dad tried to start his own home improvements company right into recession, you know, as things, were starting, financial crisis. as things were starting to take off straight into recession. So my perception of money has always been, money has been a precious commodity. 
money was never a tool money was never you know something you could lose as use as leverage money was like an, just a necessity to to survive effectively so my perception of money was always like it was just nuts you know and so to have a thousand pounds in my bank account was like it was mind blowing yeah it was it was a pro it was a figure that you would never have expected to see and to do it from your own I appreciate it. anyone working in a job there's an element of hard work but to do it from your own ingenuity is i guess is a different feeling to that as well like even nowadays like for example i only recently launched a product off the back of the podcast the podcast masterclass so people can learn to create podcasts like this one the tide notification of that going into my business bank account for like we're talking like 300 quid whereas like the commission i'm earning from my day job like yep. it dwarfs it of course it does the buzz i got from that was like oh wow that was really interesting because it's completely yep. me all me all yep. my hands which feels different yeah and it's it's like that in trading now for me it's the only thing that really gives me that buzz um you know not actually executing the trade or closing the trade but taking a withdrawal from like a prop firm of like i don't know 20 grand that there's a as a really unique feeling it's a unique feeling above taking a withdrawal from your own personal trading account that's a great feeling but you know taking money from the business you know it's kind of non plus to get paid from like a proprietary trading firm and to take like a five figure payout it's a surreal feeling of you course know. it is strange how important was some of the business experience you were gathering from for example having conversations with a factory in china at like 17 18 years yeah. old how important has that been to you and the experience you've gone on to have it's just more it's just another strength to your bow really being able to it's not necessarily okay well that skill is directly transferable but i can look back at that time i mean tcs went on to not only produce radio antennas we were producing um vests for body armor which i had designed all myself you know using using cad programs and all that kind of thing we designed a, a full suite of different products and i was working with manufacturers and in, in the uk and all that kind of stuff to produce these we sold night vision i was building um what's called anvis which is pilot pilot night vision the actually the us delta force and stuff like that began to to use anvis themselves because they were much lighter the optics on them were much clearer and all that kind of stuff but i was importing these housings from the states i was importing the um image intense fire tubes <clears throat> the image intense fire tubes from turkey from military auctions i was building these night vision units selling them again i'm 17 years old so are all those skills directly transferable into trading, finance, training? No, but it, it's something I've done. And I can say I've done that, you know, the sense of accomplishment. I would meet people at these airsoft events and they'd go, do you work for TCS? And I'd go, no, I am TCS. And they're like, oh, wow. So how long have you been doing electrical engineering? And I'm like, I don't, I'm an architecture student. And they'd be like, you know, what are you on about? So I've always... I've had no training in finance, you know, no academic training. I've had no academic training in business, no academic training in electrical engineering. So against all, all odds, I go out and, and find some form of mastery at, in these areas. All it does is it just, it reminds me that it's possible. It's possible. Um, and so if I ever want to venture out into another industry, I know I can do it because I'll find, I'll find a way to do it. Yeah, absolutely. When then... In terms of timeline, did Kavanagh Barnwell start? Wow. Um, yeah, so so KB probably started 2019. So I may be at this point four years into discovering trading, but a year and a half maybe into, I, I don't know the exact dates, you know, so much of that time's a blur, but it was probably started sooner than it should have been in all honesty in fact indefinitely again that's that over ambitious thing where i'm like i can definitely do this you know but that probably started it probably got kicked off in 2019 it probably wasn't in in full flight until 2020 yep what enabled you to start it then because you had tcs you were trading, you had a passion, you were building up some capital through yeah. friends, through yourselves, through your business, you were funneling it towards, you tried the signals thing, it hadn't really yeah. worked, albeit it maybe got you into the market and, 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 yeah. and experimenting and it probably given you a lot of different experiences in terms of like, that didn't work, this might work instead. What enables you to maybe start 
like what what form did KB start in? How would you describe it? So actually, a friend of mine from Airsoft, he had said to me, "Why don't we start a trading company?" And so KB was actually initially called KL KL Trading. Now he didn't have any you know kind of knowledge in trading or anything like that. And what attracted um, him? He he was he was following what I was doing, and he said, "Let's you know let's start a company then." And I thought, okay. And after a while, he's down in England. And I realized, you know, this probably isn't going to work. I had known Callum from college. We had we were, we were in the same class when we were studying architecture. And I think one day I'd met him in the gym or something like that. We decided to work out together. I introduced him to trading. And then I said to him, do you want to, do you want to be part of this? And so we started KB. <laughs> Amazing, yeah. And what were those early days like? What were you offering? What were you doing? The early days were just were amazing, really, because I dropped out of college by this point. And what was the trigger for that? The success of TCS? Yeah. I saw TCS, and that's the way I described it to my parents. I said, TCS is like my baby right now, and it needs my all of my attention. If it doesn't get all of my attention, it could perish, you know? And but if it does, it could really flourish. And so two months before getting my HND and getting ready to go into uni for architecture, I dropped out of college. And, you know, it was a it was a pretty, pretty interesting time. But those first days of KB were phenomenal because I'm not at college. I'm able to go to the gym whenever I want. I've, you know, I've got this this sense of independence. And effectively, me and Callum are you know, going to Costa and teaching him how to trade. We're going to the gym. You know, I'm going home doing a bit of trade and doing some work for TCS. It was just, it was surreal. A fun period in life. Yeah. How soon did you become profitable as a trader? Because we're we're over four years in from you first downloading Trading Two One Two. You've started KB. What does the P and L look like, for example? It's very very difficult to gauge because I don't have track records back that far. This is the problem. So if you, if anybody goes and looks, they can see my track records dating back to 2022. It was in 2022 that I decided I need to have public track records available. So I could say to you right now, oh, I was profitable in 2019. People are like, yeah, we'll prove it. So I can only show f as far back as 2022. Although from the very early days of KB, we had a, a telegram group where I was sharing all my trades. So you could look back through that all the way back to 2019 and see you there's know, some how, receipts how, how things how things were going but anybody who wants to get into trading i will typically say to them be prepared for this to take two or three years for you to crack it however what i see with most of my students and stuff like that now because i've gone through the blood sweat and tears we can get them to the point where they've at least taken their first payout from a prop firm typically within 12 months you know quite comfortably yep I guess for the for the listeners, when people say trading, they automatically think Forex. And I was telling you before, I've only ever had one episode where we've really gone deep on Forex in particular with somebody who's quite credible in the space, yeah. VP from No Nonsense Forex, great YouTube channel. But you aren't just trading Forex or weren't just trading Forex. I guess to give the listeners a really full understanding of what you were up to, let's talk about some of the asset classes and what that involves. So the range of products that I've traded is quite vast. I've traded... European bond futures, German bonds. I've traded, you know, US government bonds, uh, various stock indexes and CFDs. What I really specialize in is currencies and commodities. So, you know, I've, I've traded pretty much every product that's out there. Yep. And commodities would be things like oil, gold? Gold, silver. Silver. Coffee, sugar. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, wheat. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. I like it because I think, as I say, there's always an ignorance when these things come up. And something I was thinking about in preparation for this is the visceral reaction that people have towards trading oh, yeah, and that term. And if you look at your comment section, sometimes you'll see that that's like, you can see where that comes from. People have uh, an aversion to the term because of some of the things that are associated with it. And you actually have demonstrated maybe why in this conversation, because your initial exposure to signal yeah. groups, for example, left a sour taste in the mouth. Trading deserves the bad rap, bad, um, rap that it has not because of trading itself, but because of the majority of people have the loudest voice within it. You know, when I say it deserves the bad rap that it has, legitimate people aren't loud enough in this space. See, the guys who are legitimate often are quiet. They're often quiet. 
and this really annoys me. You might have seen on my story yesterday, I was putting that call out to people like, can all of you guys who are legitimate start posting your track records and start being public about it and have bring this transparency to the space? So trading will deserve the bad rep that it has as long as the legitimate people are staying quiet and staying in their own lane. You know, staying in your own lane is a glorified thing. Just don't stay in your own lane. If there's darkness over there, go and sh shine a light into it. And this this comes from the, the Christian worldview as well. Our response, my responsibility as a Christian is to shine light in every space that I'm in. So what does that mean? What does light do? It exposes darkness, first of all, and it also provides um, illumination for the path ahead, et cetera, et cetera. My job is to expose darkness. My job is to show, show a better way. And until more people have that attitude of the legitimate guys coming out and exposing the darkness and shining that light, trading deserves the the bad the bad um, rap that it's got. Yeah, the phrase that comes to mind when you're talking about that is be the change you want to see. Yeah. So you were calling for people to publicly show their wins and their losses in terms of the last month, the last three months, the last quarter, whatever it was, so that people can get an understanding of what the reality looks like. And interestingly enough, your last three or four months of 2023 were some of the most successful you've ever had. I saw you released like an equities graph yeah. that showed that. And that's great because you're showing the positives. But even when you looked within that graph, there were days where there were notable drawbacks. Not huge, of course, because your overall trajectory was really positive. What's enabled you to have that most successful period in the last little while? Preparation. Um, being prepared. So the way the markets work for me, and you know, this is the way I teach, I have a data backed and statistical edge within the markets. I use historical data and through a various process of, of data analysis through in and out of sample testing, you know, we could go into all the numbers and all that, but it's pretty boring. My job, you know, my job is mostly Excel. Uh, you know, I, I'm an, I have Excel mastery, you know, all the formulas and all that kind of stuff. But I have a system that makes money, not every time, not every month, not every quarter, but over time. So I have a system that is very systematic. And if I employ that system and apply it in the way I have tested over a large enough sample size, it will yield a net positive result. My job in trading is to turn up and to click the button, turn up, click the button, turn up, click the button, regardless of what happens, regardless of how I feel about it, regardless of what the markets look like, to turn up and click the button and to put into practice that strategy that I've tested. And that will yield positive results over time. Positive results over time could look like winning six months of the year, losing six months of the year. It could look like winning two months of the year and losing the other 10 or break even the other 10. It's the distribution of wins and losses is absolutely, totally, totally random. I don't see any trend across my historical data of, okay, December's a bad month or January's a good month or anything like that. The distribution of wins and losses is totally random. I apply the system that works and you know, I, I catch fish if you like. It's what took you time to build the system in the way that it's built? It's, it's just a, a, such an amazing story. Um, it was actually through running the trading floor and having a team of guys there. I have an exceptional market read, right? I can look at the markets and say, that's gonna bounce there. That doesn't mean I'm gonna make money on it. And what I discovered pretty early on in my career, especially when running the trading floor, was being able to call the markets means nothing, you know? being able to predict what's going to happen next actually doesn't mean anything. Execution is, is is what it comes down to. So although I had such a great market read, communicating that to the guys who I was training on the trading floor was exceptionally difficult. How can you teach someone to see things the way you see them? It's almost impossible because you have years of experience. Your eyes are, are tuned, if you like. Um, you know, I was on Zoom with a good friend of mine, a trader from London uh, the other day, and he's he's quite big in crypto and that kind of thing, but he's not, you know, a, a great technical analyst or anything like that. Uh, I don't think he would he would claim to be, but he showed me a chart and I said, yeah, it's gonna, that's going to go down to, to that level. It's a crypto chart. I've never seen this crypto in my life, um, you know, practically. And he says, what makes you say that? And I'm like, it just looks like, to me, it just looks like it's going to go down there. Well, you know, it's gone, it's, it's played out. Um, I can just, re I can read the market as well. You can't teach that. You can't teach someone to to read markets well. It's a bit like, 
you know when you have judges in like a men's physique or a bodybuilding competition or whatever and you're the judges talking about muscle maturity and all this kind of stuff it's like fullness these guys it, yeah. are very experienced you're looking at what they're saying you're like i can kind of see what you're saying but if you put two people in front of me i can't tell which you know if that's there's more maturation in that guy's pecs or whatever there's experience in time and i had so much time on the markets that i could I can read them very 2015, well. 2015, people yeah. people forget that. You were in so so yeah. early. You can't, but you can't teach market read to people. And I had one guy on the trading floor who interestingly came from a joinery background. The best people I've ever taught, you know, I've had people with finance degrees, I've had people degrees in chemical engineering, degrees in law, university educated, whatever you like. The best guys, bricklayer, joiner, carpenter. The best people I ever taught, the best guys who ever worked on my training floor, bricklayer, joiner, carpenter, um, which is just, it, it, it's funny. But um, one of the guys, joiner, he was employing a lot of what I was teaching on data and statistics and that kind of thing. And he said a few things which sparked some ideas and I decided to transition out of a market reading forecasting based view of the markets into let's start doing something that's a bit more statistical. And the way I would describe it to you is like, it's like two types of fishing, you know, the discretionary trader with the market read is like the guy who's, you know, he's reading the the river and he's looking for the exact spot and he, he goes in with his, his fly and he drops it right in the exact spot. The statistical trader is the one who says, the river comes down to a, a choke point here. I'm going to sit here with a net and you know what? in the next three hours, I might get two or three fish. The guy who's, you know, going along the bank, he's an expert, maybe he gets 10. The guy who's sitting at the mouth of the river, he maybe only gets three, but he knows statistically, you know, from from what's happened historically, they're gonna come down this way, I'm, I'm gonna get a couple. That's a helpful analogy. And I think given your personality type, you can see why you are towards that side. Yeah. You know, and this is why you look at my results, they're not, they're not anything to write home about. They're pretty bland. They're pretty average results, but, that's exactly what what I'm looking for. And that, the mastery for me has come in building the strategy that produces results that are profitable. They're not anything to write home about. But the thing about that is something that's kind of bland average results, very, very easy to maintain from a, a statistical perspective. If you produce a system that has a 90% win rate and returns three to one results, you know, um, risk reward on, on every trade, your equity curve is going to look like that. At some point, that system's going to break. That's not maintainable. You've, you've, what you've found is you've found something that is what's called curve fitted. You've found something that is extremely, um, is extremely profitable within a niche in the market. And as soon as something changes in the market, that thing's going to snap. My equity curve just gradually trends up the way, has these dips, has these spikes, because it, it's just something that works. It's called what we would call a robust system is broad. You can take my system and apply it to any section of market data, any cross section of historical data, and it'll it'll yield a somewhat positive result. You've been really complimentary of Tom Dante as an educator in the space, and that's somebody that you learned a lot from. He is a discretionary trader or his methodology is that's that, right. but you've moved away from that. How can you learn from somebody who does something different, but then go slightly your own way? it's just it's just the same as you know how you can study um you know chemistry or physics and then end up having an antenna business you know or a trading business you take what works and you discard what doesn't you you, know, you take a mouthful and you spit out the bones if you like now tom is remember what i described to you about on the trading floor it was impossible to communicate my market read well it was impossible for tom to communicate his market read to me Tom's, you know, I still speak to him on a relatively frequent basis and we're always having this debate about whether discretionary or systematic trading works better, whether trading psychology exists or whether it doesn't. We have these kind of debates and that kind of thing all the time. Um, but the base concepts, the foundations of, of his kind of approach are still things I employ today, albeit I've refined them um, and, and changed them quite a bit. But I... As I say, I took what worked and developed statistical models around it, found statistically, maybe it'd be better doing this, maybe it'd be better doing that, and built those into, into mechanical systems. Yeah, one of the questions I often ask in the podcast is, what is an area of work that you can handle the pain better than others? 
And I guess if I was to almost answer that question for you, which is bad practice, but I'm interested in doing it anyway, <laughs> it seems to be that ability to go and do the systematic work, the hours in the Excel that maybe some other people aren't willing to do and put up with, and they wouldn't be suitable to employ your methodology because of your ability to sit with the Excel for 70 hours a day and just execute over and over and over again on the work that was done away from the charts and away from yeah. the exciting time. In this industry, in my industry, you take money from the people who aren't prepared to put in the work that you are. It's as simple as that. Yeah. How many people that have you, because it, it's interesting you brought up the trading for because KB's had a number of different business models throughout its yeah. period. That period of time, one of your ambitions was to have like 15 guys on a trading for, what would that be called? A prop firm? Yeah. Why was that the ambition at that period of time? So people, I was, I had been a young guy with, you know, no capital to trade and now KB now is in a position where I'm I'm trading. I've got money to trade. I've got a company, a training business that's got a lot of revenue. And I'm like, what do most people do? Well, they're you know spending it on holidays to Dubai and Lambos and all that kind of stuff. I'm like, what if I could spend this on guys who were in the position that I was in, young guys undercapitalized with an ambition for the markets, and I can give them money to trade. Let's try it. That's like um, providing funding for people who want to do the same thing yeah. that you are it's, it's like you're effectively backing them you know it's like investing in a business you know i would be getting a percentage split of of their money of their profits you know and during that period of time what was the timeline like did it start off really well or it peaked it troughed I, I mean my my lack of business acumen uh certainly certainly um became evident i i scaled the business far too quickly before before you know it we've got an office that's five grand a month with you know panoramic city views the high, one of the highest office buildings in glasgow and all that kind of stuff private parking the whole lot you know it was just it was very very unwise we'd spent you know 20 odd grand on computer kit for the office and we we're spending like 20k a month and my business focus shifted to the trading floor instead of our social media and all that and so the momentum that we had began to gain through YouTube, you know, I released my first day in the life video, got 300,000 views or whatever uh, in, in the middle of lockdown. That momentum began to, it's like, you know, when you fling a stone up in the air and it's accelerating, it's accelerating, it's accelerating. And then at some point it begins to plateau and then it comes crashing down the other way. So our expenses, monthly expenses had went through the roof and the revenue didn't keep up with it. And before you knew it, we were now a company that was spending a lot more than it was making. And I'm thinking if I can just get these guys to the right point where I can fund them and they can start making money. But you know, your your business is now dependent on 15 guys making money. And before you knew it, I thought we need to scale back a little bit. And so we did. What was that decision like for you to make? It was the easiest decision I ever made. Okay. And I I've no no decision in business has ever been hard for me really apart from you know i guess the, the one hard decision was when myself and callum parted ways um you know callum was kind of co-running the business with me if you like it wasn't you know written into that legally or anything but um he, we had a plan to do that and at, at some point i felt he probably wasn't uh, doing what he should be doing you know he was probably and you know I'll I'll take the the blame for that and say I wasn't keeping him accountable and that kind of thing and perhaps I didn't make my expectations of him clear but I, I felt I was putting my all into it and perhaps he wasn't and you know at, at some point we had to I had to tell him look this isn't working the way you expected um, and that was in 2021 that that's the only hard business decision I've had to make but the rest of them, for example, pivoting away from the the trading floor, it made it made sense in your mind, so you committed to it. Yeah, I mean, we we didn't abandon the trading floor altogether. We moved office. We scaled down to something that was like half the price, and you know, with similar size actually, and in a better location. So it was easy. You know, we got an office on the corner of Buchanan Street in the Fraser's Building. We had you know an office that could house fifteen people quite comfortably. It was, you know, three floors up, so you're still relatively close to street level. You're you're bank central, and you know it was just an ideal location. We were at the 
we were on the busiest intersection in Scotland. So we had our branding in the windows and all that kind of stuff. It was great. And it was saving us money. And we were able to condense the team down to like a core group of six guys who were relatively solid. Yeah. And how did that go? Well, it went well for a while. And and then it didn't, you know. Again, What do you think are the big factors there? Because you said your lack of business experience and acumen was a challenge because you scaled too quick. You came a bit too heavy, not lean enough. Yep. Big office. You scaled down the model. You've clearly got a voracious appetite for sharing your methodology and like leading from the front as well, which I think yep. is a really important thing in any in any in any leader or any manager. But what maybe led to it not going as well as you wanted it to? We were a very cohesive team <clears throat> um, initially at KB. There was a massive party culture. We would have you know parties in the office lots of drink you know lots of substances and that kind of thing we would go out for drinks at lunch and uh, all that kind of thing we would go to raves together the whole lot when i became a born again christian that all changed uh, i was kind of like the the grinch i was a very very different person i used to go in you know and i'd be swearing at the guys and i'd be getting them riled up and all that kind of stuff and you know there was a, a real kind of lad culture that was from the top down and it was echoed throughout, you know, it would, um, it would, it was reciprocated, you know, quite nicely. And, uh, you but, build a, you built a team in the mirror image of you to some extent. Yeah, exactly. People had moved from Ireland. People had moved from England to come and work for me. They had seen this flash lifestyle online. They'd seen the guy that was into partying, the guy that was into, you know, all this kind of stuff that appeals to the flesh. When I, when I, uh, got saved, all of that changed. I was no longer this you know, super arrogant, like prideful guy who's obsessed with women and, you know, getting on it and all that kind of stuff. And so um, when that changed, some some of those bonds began to break down. And I think when you're no longer, when you then just become that guy that, that's at work and, you know, you kind of become the, the, the kind of, not the negative voice, but you kind of become the person who's like, when people want to be doing what they want to do you're kind of that that contrary voice it's like yeah actually i don't want to go out and to that club and stuff like it that it was less what they signed up for so i know you've said some guys went out themselves to <clears throat> trade themselves some guys pivoted within the industry some guys moved away from it as well and yep. i think that's natural when a change like your uh, born again christian um journey occurs and i want to pop a pin in that for just now because i want to go back to that period where you had the trading for and one of the first times that I ever saw your content was when you appeared on BBC's Insta Traders. Yep. Um, really interesting experience because the way that that was portrayed was one of the ways that when you were talking about the negative view of the industry, that almost was an attempt to add to that negative view of the industry in terms of how you as an individual and KB as a firm were painted during that time. So what's interesting to to those who maybe aren't plugged into the space they probably wouldn't pick up on this, but what Insta, what BBC tried to do was not to paint KB in a negative light, but they tried to use KB to paint FTMO in a negative light. FTMO is the best known, largest prop firm in the entire trading industry. They've won Europe's Fast 50 Award, you know, like five years in a row. They're one of the highest regarded companies in the trading space, if not the highest right now. Anyone who knows anything about trading knows that these guys are a legitimate firm and they were really starting to gain popularity in 2020. Now, my perception and understanding of how this went was the BBC actually contacted me for information. They said, can you tell us about the industry? Who are the bad players? Who are the good actors? Who are the bad actors? And I gave them kind of broke this down. I said, look, prop firms, FTMO, et cetera, good. Education, good signals groups you know all these guys in dubai with their rented lamp was not that bad they thought great now they got funding and all that kind of stuff for the documentary the director phoned me and she was like listen we're, we're actually ready to film this here's what we're kind of going with and it was exactly as i kind of structured it for them things got put on hold because of covid and over covid the financial conduct authority stepped in and wiped a lot of these scammers off the face of the earth. Instagram shut down their accounts, the Daily Mail, et cetera, started to report on this. All of a sudden, it's now old news, you know? And 
my understanding of what happened was they were left with half a documentary, which was the kind of good side. And they thought, how can we... Now, they did hit on IML, which is like a massive kind of cult in the trading space. And they'd done a pretty fair job on that. But when it came to FTMO, they took very public and you know well-known information about FTMO and tried to spin it as if it was some kind of fraud, fraudulent thing. Um, you know, and in that interview, when they were interviewing me before, which you don't see, they were asking me a lot of very personal questions, making some accusations and that kind of thing to get me quite worked up. And then when they came in to ask questions about FTMO, they made it look like I was this FTMO affiliate making loads of money. I've made about 300 euros from FTMO, that partnership, since 20, 2020. I've made about 300 euros. They made it look like, you know... That was your main revenue stream. That yeah. was what the... I remember watching it and it was very much like, Sam runs this trading floor, does a bit of trading, but actually his main focus is funneling people into this prop firm. Yeah, uh, whereas my main focus was starting a prop firm myself and getting those guys funded with my own money and FTMO was just like maybe a means to an end or something else that people could do. So I'll be honest, the partnership I had with FTMO was actually for us, not financially, but because FTMO was such a credible firm, when they you know, wanted to work with us, I thought, great, this adds another layer of legitimacy to us. You know, it's like if, I don't know, um, BPN or MyProtein or something like that wanted to work with you, as I know they already do. All it does is it's just further accreditation to, to you as a person and as a brand and that kind of thing. So when FTMO wanted to work with me, it's like, this this just shows even further that FTMO only work with top top guys, so that was interesting um, because here I am getting slammed as like this devious FTMO affiliate that's profiting off the back of all these, and yet I've made three hundred euros in in four years of working with FTMO. I say famous, but I don't mean famous. But the kind of clip where you are ruffled and you're like, "Look, I'm not FTMO," and you see your face yeah. just looking at the, the the camera, like, "What is going on here?" That was what they used to be like, "Oh, they got you moment." Yep. And what I've come to understand, and I went and watched a YouTube video where you were speaking with an American YouTuber about almost like this is what the documentary was was initially proposed as. This is the things we we're going to cover, and of course, the whole. Actually, we had like a a, a a long conversation before they started asking me about FTMO that got me in a, a headspace yeah. that meant that I kind of pushed back when they started asking me about FTMO. And equally, you can understand why somebody would be frustrated where they are trying to paint you in a light that you're not comfortable with. Yeah. It would be like, let's say I'm interviewing you and I said, so so Colin, how how is my protein's way protein made? You're like, but I don't know, and you're, and I'm like, so you know, do you know this cow? You know they they done this and that. So how do you feel about promoting that? Like, why are you promoting this when that happens? And you're like, listen, I have nothing to do with how the products are made. I use the products myself, and I get good results from them. And I see that they're effective. The protein's not amino spiked. It's got great, great stats and all that kind of stuff. That's that's, that's why the extent I share of my it. knowledge. Yeah, you know, and it's and it's, it's good value for money. They're a good they're a good company. Their shipping times, customer service, great. That's why I. Promote them. I don't know what happened to you know Daisy the cow in some you know factory farm in Ireland. Yep, I'm they like, make it obscure. And I'm like, depth. you should know that if you're promoting that to your. I'm like, so when they're coming on and they're like, so you know how does this work and how does that work and I'm like, I don't know. Here's what I know: FDM will have a product. When you pass the challenge and you make money on the account, the trading conditions are great and they pay you what you make. They they adhere to everything they promise. So if a company says we're going to do x y and z and they do x y and z how can you slam me because the way they do y is not the way you thought they done y yeah it's it, it's incredible what do you think you learned from that experience um just the deceitfulness of mankind you know I, it's it, it showed me what i already knew about about the heart of man you know I brought these people onto my trading floor. We had coffee together. We had tea together. We had laughs together, these directors. And we had great banter. I mean, we were working together for like nearly a year. We spent hours on the phone and, you know, we we had food together, had coffee together, a whole lot. I really liked these people and they really liked me. And, but it was all, I wouldn't say it was all a charade. I would say it was all genuine, but when it came to the edit they were like we need to throw them under the bus you know and so they they betrayed the friendship and that kind of thing that we built some interesting moments we were recording in a gym <clears throat> to to get a clip of me on the phone to a client and the cameraman 
I'd love to name him, but I'm not going to do it. He said, ask him if he'd rather work in KFC. I was on the phone to a client. Ask him if he'd rather work in KFC. That's what he said to me. I said, I am not going to say that. And he said, why not? I said, because that's like, what is this? Like some Jordan Belfort, like thumping the desk, like, yeah. uh, you know, if you don't uh, want to go, trade, go and, and, you know, get your shop in it, you know, whatever it is he says. But I'm like, is that what they're trying to portray this as? And when they were filming on the trading floor, they put mic packs on the desk and they said, listen, lads, don't like punch the desk or anything like that because of the mic packs. And I'm like, what do you think this is? This is like a library in here. It's not, we're not punching desks. You know, we're not flinging monitors around and all that. They're thinking it's like, you know, some kind of Wolf of Wall Street type thing. And w they were filming with me at one point and they started to ask me questions about my faith and that kind of thing. And um, when they stopped recording, they said, I said, some of those questions were a bit strange. And the cameraman said, you know, it was just, there was only two or three of them. This was during COVID, they didn't have a big team. He said, and my wife witnessed this, he said, listen, everyone we speak to, they, they only say good things about you. We need to find something. Otherwise people just think we're promoting you. So he was like, we need balance here because everything we've got is good. Now, everything good that they had somehow didn't make it into the documentary. They had went and done, um, you know, interviews and spent days with some of my members who were like 19 year old guys, FTMO funded, made, you know, thousands of pounds from FTMO. Some of that, never, you know, none of that made it into the documentary, even though these guys showed that they were making money from FTMO, et cetera. Yeah, it, that, that, feel, that feels sore because as you said, you put trust in them to portray it in a way that you were going to be happy with. Yeah. And it wasn't the case of balance. It was a case of let's try and have a bit of a hatchet job. Yeah. So that's sore. That's that, that that's really sore. But I guess like in terms of lessons, it's maybe painted that some people will act in their own self-interest at all times. Yeah. I mean, if this, this might be stupid, but I wouldn't hesitate to, to work with a TV channel or anything like that again. I wouldn't, you know, now that being said, you know, channel five and that kind of thing have been in contact with me to, to do, you know, various business programs and all that. And I've not went for them, but it's not because I'm like, oh, what if they portray me in a bad light? I just, it's not something I'm overly seeking or pursuing at this point in my career, but I would still, I have no problem with someone mischaracterizing me or, or misportraying what I say. That's, that is on them. You know, I know God knows where I am. And I'm like, I will speak and I will speak truth. And if you want to spin that or misconstrue that or whatever, it's injustice. But there's a, a scripture where Jesus says, suffer yourself to be defrauded. You know, allow, allow, allow it to happen to you. You know, it's, it's not on you. Your faith was developing during that period. Did that enable you to deal with potentially what felt like a character assassination? Yeah. I mean, I, I already had a, a foundation of grew up in a somewhat Christian household, although, you know, it was Christian in name only. You had the kind of the basic morals. You know, I, I started reading the Bible when I was about eight years old, but there was no real application of it. There was no lifestyle that matched it. You know, this country, the 60% of this nation will tell you they're Christian, but they, they don't go to church. They don't read the word. They don't live a moral life, etc. So that was us. You know, we were in that camp. But I already had somewhat of a knowledge of the, the heart of man and the character of 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 mankind and you know the pursuit of of money and what people will do to to obtain it and that kind of thing. So it, it, I dealt with it in that way. But in many senses I, I after I got saved I began to see you know what I I was absolutely no different to they were at that time. I had I had just as much corruption in my heart. I was just as you know crooked or whatever. Um I would, I would just as, I would probably in their shoes have done the same thing, et cetera, et cetera. Now I wouldn't obviously, but I can look back at that and say, there was me being almost self-righteous and judging them for effectively just doing their job. You know, journalism, that's what they're doing. It's not nothing personal. They're doing their job. They're trying to get a paycheck. And would, would I have done that in their position? I can't say I, I wouldn't, you know, based on the type of person I was back then. Yeah. What led to you being saved? Oh, um, you know, God's grace, it's, it's all, all a work of him effectively. Now, I, I believe in a completely sovereign God. I believe he does what he pleases. I believe he has mercy on whoever he has mercy. And at, at the time appointed, you know, on his calendar, he began to draw me. So business had been going well and all that kind of stuff. I was very caught up in materialism, car, money, you know, all that kind of stuff. 
taking drugs, getting drunk, unfaithful in relationships, you name it. What, what most guys do, but just quite amplified, very um, self, self uh, interested, very selfish. And that was my life. I, I loved money. I had a, a love of money and, and material things and all that kind of stuff. And I was just, in general, I would still have called myself a Christian at that time, but I wasn't, you know, I was, I was a hypocrite. I wasn't a, a, a very nice person. I wouldn't have enjoyed my Were you company. happy then? No. No. Momentarily at, at different points? Peaks and troughs. It, the, the buzz of the money hitting the account, maybe the, the purchase that you maybe wanted for a long time. The the thing about sin, I, sin is simply just the transgression of God's will or commands, is sin is enjoyable, but only for a season. It's the f called fleeting pleasures. You know, it speaks about in scripture, the fleeting pleasures of sin. It's it's temporal. It's it's not lasting. There's no lasting satisfaction, fulfillment, peace in, or peace in it. It's something that in the moment you get, you get in, intense you know satisfaction out of gratification whatever it is um and that is certainly what my experience was but in the quiet moments i felt empty you know people would tell me i wish i had your life and i would revel in that i would revel in the fact that people were jealous of me and that kind of thing but in my quiet moments i felt what do you think that came from i felt empty what the the reveling in you know you could you could blame it on ah oh, well you grew up with without having a lot of stuff that's definitely a factor in it, but it's no excuse. For, it doesn't excuse it. Our our conditions and situations, different people, um, you know, have different situations and conditions that they grow up in, etc. But it's never an excuse for for the way you behave. Um, so definitely a contributing factor is not growing up with prosperity, but effectively all all of that sinfulness and stuff like that came, you know, certainly. Um, perhaps had its roots in that P me liking the idea of people um coveting what i had and all that now i look back on it and it's that's just the most vile um the most vile in 2015 behavior. you said that the fact that it drew interest and status that you were trading at the the the, the, the lunch hall table was something that boosted who you were and who like who you were seen as image obsessed image obsessed but so everything was kind of going well at that time and then i guess there was a point in where the the money had really gone to my head in early 2020 and i i got very very carried away i was being unfaithful you know in, in my relationship and that kind of thing and um it, it led to a bit of a, a crossroads and i was absolutely you know, running headlong into self-destruction. And by God's grace, in just a, a moment of clarity, I, I saw the, the condition that I was in. I saw the danger that I was in and I began to flee from it. And over a period of probably about six months in 2020, I began to, or 2021, oh, maybe get this mixed up, whatever. But I, I began to to read the scriptures again and, and pursue, you know, godliness and that kind of thing. But it was, you know, it was progressively building. It wouldn't be until the end of 2020 when, you know, I would, things would really start to, start to shift the business or starting 2021, maybe the dates are all so muddy, right? See, during that COVID, the lockdowns and all that is yeah, just such a blur. Yeah, I, 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 a lot of the time I was like, this, the, the, the spring lockdown and the winter lockdown, oh, 2020. It, it's, yeah. it's all just a, a blur, but, you know, around the time when I had started the trading floor properly, the business had started to not do so well and that kind of thing. And I was going to performance psychologists and all that. And, you know, nobody could cure me effectively. And towards the end of wrap, towards the end of that first office that we wrapped up before we scaled down, I, you know, I was actually actively reading the scriptures and that kind of thing at that time, listening to music to calm my mind. That happened to be, I ended up listening to like Christian music. And one day, you know, I was sitting in the bathroom at work. This was towards the end of closing up that office, sitting in the bathroom at work. I was so stressed out. Trading wasn't going so well. Business wasn't going so well. And the lyrics to this psalm that I was listening to, I opened it up on my phone. And as I read it, I just broke down in tears. 
I saw the mercy of God towards, you know, the the children of Israel who were a rebellious nation at that time who had just transgressed all of his ways and had basically forgotten about him. But and he allowed them to to fall and there was no one there to help them get back up again. And it's in the pit of despair that they cry out to the Lord. And it says just without any break, you know, they cried out to him in their distress. Very next verse. He heard them, you know, he, he delivered them from their pain. Um, and the deliverance of God, the faithfulness of God, the mercy of God, the love of God, it broke me. And I was sit sitting there, you know, in this bathroom, still crying my eyes out. And it was around that time that I began to really seek the Lord. I began to cry out to him for salvation, began to wake up early in the mornings and get into the word and cry out, cry out to God. And over the, the next half of 2021 over the sort of middle of 2021 is when I actually got saved. I was baptized in July, uh, 2021. And then, you know, from then on, it's just been an upwards trajectory. So during that period where you have this moment where things perhaps come to a head yeah. and you truly believe that I'm going to cry out to God and he's going to save me. What do your steps after that look like between then and getting baptized you 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 have a voracious appetite for reading yeah. scripture and understanding you have an incredible memory of reciting yeah. some of the phrases even in the drive over here you were saying oh like you've just said this let me bring yeah. this point to the fore because it, it sp spoke to you in a way and it, it largely explained what i said as well yeah. which is interesting yeah yeah so those, those steps between that and getting baptized again this period such a blur but it was a period of me just things in my life just falling away swearing you know overnight stop swearing um you know all, all these all these things that people would just see as par for the course wanting to go out and get drunk you know telling those kind of little white lies or fibs that you might do you know someone asks you oh do you want to go out and you might say oh i'm ill or whatever all that kind of stuff gone gone practically overnight with with no qualms really desiring to obey the law you know drive at the speed limit and all this kind of stuff i'm driving like a you know basically a supercar at that time i'm like you yeah, know, I yeah and I'm doing like 100 mile an hour everywhere all of that gone you know straight away and um people around me are starting to notice these differences the office is different i'm starting to you know i'm attending church at this time i'm starting to have a sensitivity to the word of god you know um it says in scripture the the word of god is sharp and powerful you know it's sharper than any two-edged sword it's quick and powerful sharper than any two-edged sword to the dividing asunder of the joints and the marrow you know the soul and the spirit so the the word of god is like a sword to the to the heart that receives it and in the sense that it can just pierce through your heart and certain things were getting read or spoken about in church and i'm just like getting convicted by it getting scriptures you know on framed and hung up on the wall on the trading floor and all that and the guys are like what are you doing you know i'm sitting at my desk reading my bible i'm becoming a bit more introspective and um things just began to change invited some of my staff along to my baptism made a very public profession around this time and life just began to change you know quite drastically things like the little white lies not swearing being the law i had a conversation with a friend the other day and they don't have a religious faith they're quite spiritual they said someone's always keeping score and for example, you go to Tesco, you forgot your bag, you take the 30p and you don't pay for the 30p bag, you don't swipe or whatever else. You you know that happens. Nobody else needs to know. You wake up in the morning and rather than make your bed, you charge out the door or you you don't make your partner the cup of tea you normally make because you're in a bad mood and you're in a rush, whatever else. Nobody really has to know that. That's within your domain. But somebody's keeping score of the kind of person that you are and how you act behind closed doors and what we do in private will typically end up manifesting in public okay. at some point down the line and that was a really interesting concept for me because i'm somebody that i feel is quite value-led quite principled but i don't necessarily think that god is watching i don't i haven't considered that god is watching me i just consider that somebody is watching me in terms of like how i am and if i am this calling in public who professes to be a pretty switched on dialed in quote unquote good person then I should probably act like it in the background too. Okay, so mankind has a conscience. You know, man has been built with a conscience. I believe in the immaterial. I do not believe we exist solely in a material um, existence. We have a conscience. The It talks in scripture about the law of God's written on our heart. Why do you not steal when there's no one around? Because you have a conscience. 
all all have an awareness of morality. There is a standard of objective morality. And this is why outside of the Christian worldview, you have no basis for morality. You have no basis for logic or reason or science. You have no basis for any of it because all of these things appeal to an abstract universal standard. There is universal standards of logic, like there's universal laws of logic, like the law of non-contradiction. Non, non there's laws of science, like the first and second law of therm thermodynamics, like the uniformity in nature, like induction. These are all abstract, universal, completely objective laws, unaffected by humans, uncreated by humans, although codified and defined by humans, that we appeal to, to, to do science, to appeal to logic and reason, you know, to appeal to morality, we appeal to these laws outside of the Christian worldview. You can't make sense of any of them. Outside of the Christian worldview. Okay. So I think one of the challenges that we have in modern society is that we have become debased from religion and some of the principles that are related to it. But me as a non, currently non-practicing <clears throat> person of faith, I hold myself to high standards because of my upbringing yeah. that wasn't necessarily religious. I was christened a Protestant in the Church of Scotland as a young boy. I went to Sunday school until I started playing rugby on a Sunday. It was at 10.30, so we started yeah. doing that instead. It, that was just how, how things were. But my nuclear family upbringing gave me a lot of values that I live to to this day. So I, I wouldn't say that someone who's non-Christian theistic can't have that. The whole world has that. But what I'm saying is it, it's living in consistently with your worldview. Okay. In what in what sense, so Sam? What, what's the so, inconsistency? The inconsistency is that I'm not doing it in service of a... No, no. A, so the inconsistency is, um, I mean, why, to what standard do we, do we adhere? To what standard do we appeal? But to what standard do we say that anything is right or anything is wrong? Without an objective standard of good, you cannot know what evil is. Without an objective standard of truth, you cannot know what is fallacious, etc. But we all do, and we all employ that because we all know, as I've mentioned to you on the drive over, we all know God. We just suppress the truth of him and choose not to believe in him and unrighteousness, whether it's a conscious or a subconscious thing. We, without God, we can't actually make sense of anything. The fact we do make sense of things, the fact we do have certainty, the fact we do employ reasoning and logic and morals is proof of what the scriptures say that we all actually do know God. It's a sense of almost having to have some sort of measure to go against. So you were saying there that we don't have standards without understanding what the standards should be, if, th if that makes sense. So for example, um, how can I measure that I'm living in alignment with the standards that God expects if I don't understand what God expects? So we already have standards in society, right? We have standards of morality. We have standards of decency and that kind of thing that we know intrinsically are right or are wrong. Without God, we have no basis for that standard. You know, by what standard is that immoral? By what standard? Oh, well, that's what society says. Well, how did that work in 1939 in Germany? You know, by the societal standard. We can say, even if we, you were transported back then, you can say this objectively morally wrong because you know that a standard of morality is not based on what's societally accepted. There is a higher objective standard of morality. Which you which you appeal to, you can't appeal to it. Um, you know, if you're following out uh, an atheistic or a non-theistic worldview, you have you actually have nothing to appeal to to say that's any more moral than or any less moral than helping an old lady cross the road. So there's a lack of a moral compass. We all have it, right? We just can't make sense of it out with the Christian worldview. So the atheist who lives morally, well, okay, I just want to do it for society and all that. But what is moral? What is good? What is evil? We all know that that exists, but it, you can't actually make sense of it out with uh, a theistic, a Christian theistic worldview. And if we look at how you've applied that then, it's removal of some of those behaviors that came previous and the introduction of some new ones? So the the reason you have a life shift, it's not like, you know, you think, okay, I want to be a Christian. I want to clean up my life. It's more of a sense of, this is where Christianity is very, very different. Christianity is not a religion in the sense of the word. What is religion? Religion is you're on this path of life. You follow this list of rules. You follow these behaviors. You follow these objectives. You follow these goals, whatever. And at the end, you know, some some deity will merit you acceptance. Christianity is the opposite. Christianity begins with acceptance. Jesus Christ said, I am the door. 
right? You, through him, immediately have acceptance. Your life lived is not a, a life lived in order to obtain acceptance. Your life is now as a child, you know, as a child of God, you now live a life to honor and to love your father. That's that's the way it works. So it's not you live a life and you might get accepted. It's once you come to Christ and you are accepted, you now live a life, you know, out of out of love. And so, um, you know, ridding myself of some of these behaviors was and an obedience but it was it was done in love it's not a, adherence to to the law for the sake of being moral it's now out of love i i want to live a life that honors god it, it's it's coming from a positive place for yourself and for those around you and your faith has enabled you to move away from living a life that wasn't like that yeah okay okay i i i, I think that's really powerful because some of your most popular videos on youtube and your most viral videos are days in the life and you mentioned that 2021 where you're going into the office and it's like the 28th of march some of like that and we're in the height of lockdown and you're one of the only people in the building how does your day differ from then to now based on the faith that's developed over that period of time yeah so back then you know you, you would wake up for work you'd wake up for yourself you would live for yourself mostly and all the things that you would do were centered around yourself you know because you are your own your own god in a sense you are your own idol you live to serve yourself now my days start off very very different i mean my whole day is different but my my day now starts off ideal morning you know i'm not one of these people who gets up at 4 a.m you know i'm not going to be like yeah get up before i go to sleep i go for a 20 kilometer run and then i get have a nice bath I have a hot shower, you know, I have a nice coffee, you know, I'm in my comfies in the morning. I put on some comfortable clothes. I'll go through at seven to my study and I'll open the scriptures. I'll begin to read and pray. Uh, sometime mid morning when my wife's up, my wife's obviously pregnant just now. She needs a bit more sleep, but we'll pray together. We'll read together. You know, we'll worship together. That's the kind of ideal morning. And then I'll be I'll be into into work, looking at the charts and and business and that kind of thing. And the the day ends off very very similar, you know, in in the word and in prayer before bed. Uh, my my life is now a life of dependence rather than independence. It's now a, a life of looking up, you know. I'm I'm I I need God for the next for the next breath, for the next step, for the next decision, for the next word that comes out of my mouth, for the next action that I do. It's a life of just continual dependence on him and, and and knowing his help through that so you have dependence on god you mentioned earlier about a, a business decision that was really hard in terms of moving away from your partnership with with callum at that period in time you said i take complete responsibility for how that I mapped out because of how i conducted myself and the communication skills that i had so there's an element of personal responsibility in some actions within life but your overarching theme is of dependence on the the, the lord that you believe in yeah that's right okay how does personal responsibility interact with that then? Are there ever any clashes? Are there ever any back and forth? So my my life and, and all that I should desire to do and aim to do and all that kind of stuff should be in conformity to the mind and will of God. So there is no clashes. My my own desires and objectives um, are subordinate to, to God's revealed will. If I want to do something and it, it becomes apparent that that's not you know, where God would have me, how would it's that discarded. show up then a level of inertia that's unable to be overcome? So the way that might look is, you know, perhaps you have the desire to move somewhere, perhaps you have the desire to go into a certain business partnership or whatever, and it's it's revealed to you that that's that's not where the Lord Where would, would that show you. up, Sam? Where would it actually show up? Reading the word in prayer, things occur to you, that so kind of thing. In this time where you're bookending your day and you're are you in conversation with the Lord? Yeah. Okay, so when you're in conversation with the Lord, you're telling him about your plans and your yeah. ambitions and what you might go on to do within your day and within your week, within your year, et cetera, et cetera. If, how vividly do you discuss what's coming up next with KB with him, for example? In detail. Okay. Trades I take, everything. Wow, um, okay. I, I commit it all to, to his hands. He's sovereign over everything. Um, you know, the, there's a scripture that says, the lot is cast, but it's in the Lord's hand effectively, you know, even the, the course of the, the, the heart of the king is like, is like a river, you know, in his hands. Mm -hmm. He, he is over everything. And this idea of the lot being cast, it's like, you know, you and I flip a coin here, the, 
the result is already determined by him you know so it's a commitment of everything to him and faith knowing that he is he is sovereign over everything so all of my business you know big business decisions trades before when i place orders in the market and stuff like that i'll pray over those kind of things i'm praying for my members i'm praying for people who are potentially taking these same positions people who are learning from me etc as well um but ab absolutely everything uh, george muller once said you know he was a oh, such an inspirational christian he said if the ink in the in the pen is worth changing it's worth praying about Okay, fantastic. I, I, I'm what I'm fascinated most about, and I think a lot of people listening is how it's impacted your ability to perform within the workplace. Do you feel it's added another Phen dynamic? Phenomenal, phenomenal. There's a scripture that says, "Work heartily as unto the Lord." Whenever, Work heartily. Whenever you do something, do it. God's my boss. You know, when I fill out my tax return, I, I'm not worried about HMRC seeing it. God's seen it already. Everything I do is he's is, kept score, so that's links to what maybe what I was saying to so some extent. What what I know is that everything I do in life, I need to do to an I need to do to an exceptional standard because it's it's an offering to God. The Puritans used to say we go to work for the same reason we go to church to worship and to glorify God. Everything in life, everything I do in life, whether it be going to the gym, whether it be changing the ink in the pen, whether it be you know etc cetera, etc, cetera, is is done in service to God. So it needs to be it needs to be pure and it needs to be right. How you do anything is how you do everything. So you hold yourself to a high standard across the board. Yeah, and well, I listen. I fail in that. All that's the time. what I'm going to want to ask you. Where, where are the areas that you fall down that you disappoint yourself and God? Oh, I mean everywhere. You know, everywhere. But here's the, the beautiful thing: is it's not a, a life of negativity. Going, oh, you know, I failed in this. I failed in that. It's a life of you know. Well, by God's grace, I'm I'm going to do better tomorrow. And it's. It's, you don't get to the end of the day and you're like, now, okay, if you fell into some kind of gross immorality or something like that, if, you know, as Chris, that has happened in Christians' lives, they fall into immorality or, you know, maybe someone asks you a question and you answer it with a kind of half-truth because you don't want to give something away or whatever, you would you would feel a, a, a sense of guilt and you would go and you would bring that before the Lord and you would, you would confess that fault. So there are, man fails, you know, it says in Proverbs that the, the righteous man falls seven times a day, but he gets back up again. You know, and that's that's the pattern of life for the Christian. It's not that the Christian the Christian is a sinner, you know, but what the Christian is is a redeemed sinner. So the, the pattern of life of the Christian is they will still have falls, they will still make mistakes, they still have faults, but they get back up again by God's grace and they press on. And each day is is further sanctification, further conformity to to the image to the person of Christ. And I guess over time, if you look at your trajectory, it's trying to limit as much as possible what those sins look like within a day so like previously large sins like the um infidelity drink drugs and partying which is clearly in contrast with his desires for you yeah. those get micro uh, like reduced down to maybe some, some smaller things that show up each day now yeah ab absolutely but the the further you go in the christian life the more conformed you are to the person and image of christ the more the smaller corruptions seems amplified so like it's all relative it's, isn't it so if you if you if you talk to somebody who lives a really morally bankrupt lifestyle they would look at you and think he's a saint yeah and that and maybe that's blasphemous you can tell you can tell me <laughs> no, they, they, they would say something like oh like goody two shoes or whatever mm -hmm. whatever the term would be probably use something rather than that but then you might compare yourself to somebody who's jesus. been on a long okay jesus would be the benchmark absolutely okay that that's the christian standard you know you the bible is so transparent right all of the main characters that are sh shown forth in the bible whether it be king david you know the the greatest king of israel whether it be the prophet isaiah whether it be you know habakkuk or micah or whoever right all of these men all of their their warts and everything are shown you see all of their rough edges there so that you could never elevate them as a standard so you see even the, the greatest king of Israel he committed adultery. Wow. You know, and it shows you all of their faults. Jesus Christ is perfect. So the Christian um, reads about all these men in, in scripture and women, but sees for all the great that they had, here was their faults, here was their lack of faith, here was their whatever it may be. And then they see Christ. All these people, every person that's shown in scripture in a positive light, is shown to exemplify a certain aspect of Christ. King David, greatest king of Israel, right? Humanly speaking, 
what does he point towards the true king of Israel, which is God manifest in the flesh, Jesus Christ. So that's the standard. So we, we compare ourselves against Christ and we see that we fall short. But what that does is it doesn't depress us. It magnifies God's grace. Because there's a quote, comparisons, the thief of joy. I actually disagree with the quote because I, I compare myself to people all the time from an aspirational perspective yeah. and I hold myself to a higher standard, which I suppose you're doing with Jesus. You're not being dispirited by your inability to be utterly perfect. <coughs> Do you believe in progress, not perfection? So there will be no perfection this side of eternity. But what the great joy is that the more... The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 6, he says, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, you know. And then he goes on to say, so should we sin that grace may abound? God forbid. You know, he's, he's not saying that, but what he's saying is when you see your corruption, when you see your, your failings, what it shows is God's grace. Grace, right? Grace simply means the unmerited, unwarranted favor of God. It's grace is, is what we all need because none of us are deserving or, or you know, um, are deserving of, we've not earned God's favor effectively. So, but God shows us, us his favor. And when you see your own failings, it magnifies God's grace. It magnifies his mercy. It magnifies his love because you see, he saved me even though he knows all of my failures. He knows my failures before I, I fail and yet still loves me. One of the big reasons that, faith and religion is showing up in more and more of my podcast conversations and more and more of many podcasters in the self-development space conversations is because society has become so debased from these values and somebody like yourself would of course point to the fact that that's because of the loss of religion and a structure and a value hierarchy society is living correctly for their worldview they're living honestly for their worldview because they have they they say okay there is no god <laughs> There is no objective standard of morality and we're just seeing them living it out. So, you know, and as as much heartache as it causes me, I tip my hat to them for living consistent with their worldview. I think if more people would live consistent with their worldview, more people would end up becoming Christians because they would see that their worldview is actually incompatible with the way they live. They live as if logic exists. They live as if reason exists. They live as, as if truth exists. Um, they live as if morality exists. And so... Upon what basis are they annoyed at people who live immoral, about people who live dishonestly and stuff like that? Because they have no objective standard to appeal to. All they can appeal to is, well, that's what I like. And it's like, well, why does what you like mean anything? Because they, we lack an overarching framework. We we have it. We just, you know, the we majority from the majority of people, that's what I read to you in Romans, suppress the truth and unrighteousness. They know it. They just suppress it in unrighteousness. So they take, they borrow from the Christian worldview um, what's beneficial to them and they, they discard what is going to limit their uh, hedonism effectively or their in, their enjoyment of sinful pleasures. Yeah. What were some of the simple pleasures that you went into previously that you've discarded? <sighs> Drunkenness, you know, uh, drugs, raving and all that. That was all the things I discarded pretty readily. How quickly were you able to discard them? Oh, practically overnight. Yeah. And you feel so much better for it? There's in the uh, book of the prophet Ezekiel, the a new covenant prophecy where God speaks about what, what will happen when Christ comes. And he says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you'll be clean. I'll put a new heart within you, a new spirit within you. I'll give you a new mind, etc." When someone is born again, so this is what baptism is, you know, going under the water. It's a physical or symbolic representation of a spiritual change that's already happened. And that spiritual change is where through faith in Christ, you are given a new heart with new desires, a new mind that thinks differently. Um, and so when people say, you know, how did that all just evaporate overnight? Because at the moment I came to faith in Christ, that heart that loved all those things was gone. That mind that thought that way was gone. You know, I was given a new heart, a new mind, a new spirit. So now I'm now living the way I want to. I was living the way I wanted to. I've never stopped living the way I wanted to. But just my desires, my heart, my mind, everything was changed. It's realigned. It's changed. Is the old Sam dead? Yeah, oh yeah, he was crucified with Christ. That's what the Apostle Paul says. He says, you know, I no longer live. I was crucified with Christ. <laughs> okay. So one of the big things that's happened is that traditional religion has been replaced by other deities other things that we put on a pedestal that we like idolize 
what are some of those things that concern you the most? That That's sort of growing in the world today. So all religion, right? You know, the, the majority, this is why I don't, you know, can call Christianity like a religion because our perception of what religion is is quite is quite different in the modern day. The word's a bit defunct in all honesty. But you know, all all religion, all these worldviews, in my estimation, are are logically incoherent, full of internal inconsistencies, um, and again can't appeal to that that ultimate standard. It's all very relative, all very subjective. Um and so it's flawed. I don't see, you know, all these different worldviews as individual things. I see Christianity and everything else. So everything else is just as, you know, we I read to you from Romans 1 when we we're on the journey over here. It's just men knowing God but desiring to worship and to serve his his own his own creations. For the listeners, and can you explain what you were explaining to me around the creator versus the creations? Yeah. God has created we exist within a continuum, right? A continuum is the co presence of time, space and matter. God exists out with the continuum and within it. You know, he's he is omnipresent, he's omnipotent, you know, he's omniscient. He is everywhere through everything and everything. You know, he's he's present right here, right now. Um, but he is he is not affected by the bounds of of the material universe in which we exist, which is this continuum. He's not bound by space. He's not bound by time. He's not um, bound by matter or any of the physical laws that, that we experience here. So God has created everything and God has made man, you know, man is not only physical and, and mental, man also has a spiritual reality. God made man to to worship him, but also to enjoy him in a in a relationship of love the in in the ancient greek in the new testament you have three types of love you have eros you have phileo and you have agape phileo is where we get the word philadelphia which means brotherly love right eros is where we get the word erotic you know it's a a, a sort of a, a love based on um perception based on sight based on a physicality and agape is is like a, a pure a pure self-sacrificial love and in service of yeah yeah and so god in love yeah that's a word that's used when god so loved the world he gave his only son agape you know so so god made man to enjoy him god is a god of love there's only two of god's attributes that are emphasized three times in scripture god is holy 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 so it's holiness is threefold emphasized in hebrew and in ancient greek literature and um, you know threefold repetition is is emphasis even twofold repetition is emphasis, but its other attribute is love. God is love. Love is of God, and He's a God of love. So God in love made man to have this relationship of love with Himself, and you know He He describes Himself in Scripture as as a father and and these types of things as a shepherd, as as a rock, as a fortress. And when man first transgressed against God, the spiritual um the the spiritual aspect of man died so all men by nature are born spiritually dead in christ that that is revived so that that is what man's kind of ultimate purpose is is to have that relationship with god that that spiritual relationship one of the things that you've been quite critical of online is things like manifestation yeah. versus prayer mm -hmm. what's your biggest challenge around that yeah i mean it's it's appealing to when people talk about channeling into the universe and all this kind of stuff, you're appealing to uh, uh, the created order. And, you know, this is what I read in, in Romans 1. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. They became vain in their imaginations, sitting there imagining that the universe has some power over them, sitting there imagining that they can they can manifest stuff into that and they become vain in it. And it talks about later on in Romans chapter one that God actually gives them over to a, a debased and to a corrupt mind. And, you know, in a sense, he actually, as they're, you know, seeking, um, you know, certain things from the universe and all that, there's a, a very real sense in which God allows them to have those things and allows them in their vain imaginations with their, their, their foolish uh, hearts being darkened and all that, he allows them to solidify themselves in that because they've chosen to 
to rebel against him. He he allows them to be to be more solidified in their in their vain delusions. But as evidence of what it says, where it says in Romans uh, one, I think it's maybe verse twenty three or something like that. It says um, they worshipped and served the creature more than the creator. So they are looking at the created order. And this is what we were speaking that. about. People are looking for order and guidance. And your interpretation would be that they're looking for it in the wrong place, but they're searching for something, whether it is an idol, a process like manifestation, uh, it could be love for, it could be, uh, I think we said, we said football team, it could be uh, a, a political view or an ideology that they've found this level of like almost home in. But for you, that home is, is, is God. Okay. So let's say you're, you're growing up, right? And your parents are separated. Your dad's super strict. He, he gives you, you know, all the things that you you want. You know, he takes you to football. He buys you the, you know, the Xbox 360 when it comes out and all that kind of stuff. He, he gives you all Unless that you, you want. Unless you play Grand Theft Auto. Yeah. But he's, he's, he's firm with you and he holds you to a high standard and he has rules. You're not allowed to eat rubbish. You're not allowed to be out after a certain time and all that. But guess what? Mom has a boyfriend, right? And he gives you all those things, but he doesn't have any of the rules and restrictions. You know what's right, but you adhere to that which is more convenient for you, which serves you without you having to be responsible or appeal to it. He's just trying to appease you because he wants to spend more time with your mum, right? You know, he doesn't want you whinging in his ear. That's what most people are doing with these idols that they serve. The universe, whatever it is, they appeal to that which satisfies their desires without holding them to a standard. We want structure, but not too strict a structure. We we want it on our own terms because we ultimately say, well, well, I'm God, you know? And what what most people would say is, you know, I believe that all, all know that God is, right? But what someone often would say to me is, even if God was real, I still wouldn't not fornicate. I still wouldn't not, you know, go out drinking and all that because I want to do these things. All they're proven is what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 1. They do know that God is, but they suppress that truth and unrighteousness. They, they actually just, they want to do what they want to do. They don't want to appeal to his His rules and his, his restrictions. But he's put those safeguards in there to protect us. They're safeguards. He's done that. And what we see in society is as we've moved away from God's um, order, society begins to collapse. We have the breakdown of homes. We have confusion. People don't even know. Children don't even know if they're a boy or a girl. You know, we have um, single motherhood rates. We have crime rates, you know, skyrocketing and all that kind of stuff, abuse within and relationships. And the downstream effects of that, which we are now witnessing. Yeah. So, I mean... This is, this is where I'm the most interested in this topic. Now, what this dusty old book that was written 2,000 years ago somehow has the perfect structure for for life for us for example let's talk about abuse within relationships right well you know we're taught in scripture a husband should love his wife in the same way that christ loved the church so a husband should have a self-sacrificial um love toward his wife to serve her okay problem over straight away i mean even jesus said the two greatest commandments love god love your neighbor as yourself if everyone loved their neighbor as herself there would be no stabbings there would be no killings there'd be no robberies there'd be no adultery there would be no crime there would be no racism. The boss Paul talks about the human race being one race, all of one blood. You know, we all go back to the same parents. There's a unity in that. In, in Christ, there is no male or female. There's no inequality within the, the, the sexes, you know? There's there's equality. Now, they have different roles. The way I describe it is like, if you look at it like this, yep, they're equal. You look at it that way, they have different roles. They fit together. So the woman has different roles in the home to what the man has, et cetera, et cetera. But if this was all followed um, perfectly, society would operate operate perfectly there would be no sin there would be no punishment would be handled correctly and all that kind of stuff there would be no injustice everything would be done correctly on the whole because of course even within the bible there's still stories of violence and treachery and missteps because people lose god within well that. yes so as i say the bible is very transparent the bible will show you what when we I talk about you know following the scripture or following god's commandments that doesn't mean you open a page and it's like okay well king david committed adultery or therefore this is a command for me to commit adultery no it's very clearly condemned in the scripture there are many things documented in the bible like slavery and um, you know like beatings and all that kind of stuff stonings Th these yeah. aren't these aren't um prescriptions for us to follow what these are, are documents of what happened what are prescriptions for us to follow 
are like the the commands in the New Testament of Jesus and his apostles, which appeal, which um you know are are for for the Christian. Understood. So those are stories of what happened. Yeah. The commandments and the guidance from the apostles is what is what we is what we ought to do. Okay. Understood. Understood. So I guess one other question I want to go a little bit deeper on is when it comes to your business and your ability to perform. What moments do you call in your faith the most? Yeah. So as I say, whenever there's a big decision to make, whenever I, let's say, you know, that be a business partnership or, you know, something like that. But on a day-to-day -day basis, when I'm taking risk in the markets, I, I'm I'm prayerful about that. I'm prayerful about that in, in business and in trading. What about in your family life? What's changed? In terms of now being Christian? Well, of course, now now our lives revolve around Christ. You know, he is he's at the center of our marriage. We're, you know, got a baby coming along in a couple of weeks. He'll be at the center of of the relationship we have with our children and that kind of thing as well. We are, you know, regular church goers uh, and that kind of thing. But it's, as I say, it's a life of dependence, very, very prayerful. And um that that's it really, you know, life life couldn't have changed more. It's it's really changed quite quite dramatically but all, all that we do we're, we're looking for wisdom we're looking for instruction we're looking for guidance on we don't make decisions um you know just me and Neve, we don't just sit down and make decisions we pray over things we think through through things like that and weigh things in light of in light of scripture as well yep how have you brought people around you on this journey with you oh i mean so this is quite a an interesting an interesting topic because through running the trading floor something i you know as i began to move along in my journey i started buying people bibles and you know we would sit and read scripture together me and some of the guys at work and all that and they weren't really all that interested in all honesty but when i got saved i mean my whole family got saved around a similar time neve my parents uh, my aunt uh my sister who was living in sweden at the time you know, all kind of independent of one another. We were all being brought along on this journey at the same time, which is quite remarkable. You first, Sam? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it was quite, quite amazing the way- Did your family happened. have any concerns about the life you were leading? No, no. I mean, they were- they weren't Christian themselves or Christian in name only. They're probably proud of like the business that you built and like how I'll, you held yourself. I'll tell you what was interesting is when I first got saved, they were actually more concerned about that. They were like, what has happened to you? You know, you're- now trying to be all this like you know righteous guy and all that and they were actually very worried about that they were saying whoever you're speaking to and all that kind of stuff you need to and then you know god came for them shortly after but um yeah so in terms of bringing people along on the journey i, I try you know i try to i share the gospel with people i love to share the gospel with people i love to um you know send people scriptural quotes and things like that that i think are relevant because it is the word of god in psalm 119 it says the word of god is a, a lamp to our feet and a light to our path it not only shows you where you're going but it shows you where you are and you know the god's word is truth you know and there's another scripture that says the entrance of thy word giveth light it shines light into situations of when people are down, when people are, you know, don't know where to go or what's going on. Very often a scripture can just bring tremendous light into that person's life or their situation. And I think it's greatly, greatly helpful. I love to speak to um, people who are on the street, you know, um, whether it be, you know, you bring them a coffee and you sit down with them and talk to them about the scriptures and, and, and the gospel and that kind of thing. Because you see that as a potential path for them to get away from the terrible situation in which they found themselves. What? my my top priority is where they're going to spend eternity i think this person's life is not great as it is you know and a lot of the genuine sincere home people you people look at homeless people and they say you know drug addict or whatever i would challenge anyone here right to next time you're in town don't step over that homeless person don't walk past them go over introduce yourself shake their hand they've not you know i mean they're not going to give you typhoid just shake their hand um and ask if you can sit down next to them and sit down on the street next to them just have a conversation with them not like oh you know how did you get here and all like and pity but just you know how's it going you know what you've been up to blah 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 just a normal conversation treat them like a you know a human being for once and what you very often discover is that these you know they're exactly like you they're actually no different but i love to speak to 
to people who are on the street because depending on on how they respond to that determines in a, in a very real way how they where they will spend eternity they may not have prosperity in this life but um they could be saved in the afterlife they, they could you know and jesus said um i go to prepare a place for you so that where i am you may be also you know he says in my father's house there are many mansions you might be on the street here but you might have a mansion waiting in heaven. Now, it's not mansion in the traditional sense that we know. It just means it just means an a, abundant a home, place a, of support, a, a place of a place of residence. And I spoke to a, a chap um, on the street uh, a few weeks ago, and I was speaking to him about the gospel, and he turns out he was a saved Christian. And I left with tears in my eyes because I was quite, I was quite kind of, um, I was having not so great a day. You know, I was feeling a little bit discouraged and stuff like that. And I went there to to speak to this guy and to share the gospel with him and to help provide him some hope. Transpired that he was a Christian and he ended up actually encouraging me. And, um, you know, he encouraged me even though, you know, he's on the street in the rain um, and all that kind of stuff. He doesn't know where he's going to spend the night. And, and I while, you, while you don't necessarily believe in the manifestation side and the vibrations and the frequency of things, do you believe that God align that event to occur yeah there's no such thing as coincidence all all is within the eternal decrees of god god um you know he is he's omnipresent as i mentioned he's everywhere he is there is nothing too hard for him he he um carefully constructs all all of history and all of the events that happen in life um in order to to bring about things like that to pick me up when i'm down and you know also to encourage that guy and that kind of thing he brings about these you know chance meetings for his own purposes and the you know the final day will reveal all of this the people you someone you bump into on the bus and you get to share the gospel with them and two years later they end up a saved christian and that kind of thing even the way i met richard you know it was um the providence of god you know and the way all that came about encouraged that and then you've helped him to go on his journey yeah exactly i mean i didn't oh the christian is called to love everyone you know um but you can you can love someone but not really like them as a person and that's exactly where i was with richard I didn't really like richard as a person we had had the same car before i was saved there was a bit of a competitive thing there i'm sure but i'd seen him online and i thought this guy you know he's, he's quite arrogant and he's even as a, a saved christian i was looking at him and i'm thinking he's quite arrogant he's quite vulgar in the way he speaks and that kind of thing and one day he messages me and says look i've invited you along to this event that we're running and so I went and, you know, we obviously we met spoke, at that yeah. event. But after it, it transpired that Richard had been attending the Church of Scotland for a couple of years. Church of Scotland's an apostate church. You know, the the General Assembly in the Church of Scotland is elevated to um, the, the position of authority over the Word of God and that kind of thing. The Church, the church of Scotland's fallen massively. There are still, no doubt, faithful congregations somewhere um, in small villages around, dotted around the country, but you know, maybe 95% of the church of Scotland's apostate. And I invited Richard to come along to church with me and he heard the truth pretty much for the first time ever preached in, in the couple of years he'd been exploring the faith. And he started to reveal things about the congregation he was attending. It transpired just, just how apostate they were. And I encouraged him to come out of that. And ever since, you know, Richard has been attending church and, um, you know, with myself and Neve. And I have seen the process of that. And we spoke about on the journey over the podcast you recorded with Richard. Even a few short months ago, yeah. You know, even a few months ago when that released, the, I was in England at a church with Richard when that released, we, had, we were staying there over the weekend. And the Richard I was with was a different person to the person you'd interviewed on that podcast. The way he spoke, his attitude, everything, um, you know, just uh, had changed quite drastically. Evolved? you know transformed okay. the apostle paul says in um romans 12 verse 1 he says be not conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so it's it's a transformation rather than um rather than an evolution it's it's actually a transformation it's it's a change of 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 being almost you know from being spiritually dead to being spiritually alive it's regeneration is what the bible calls it the regenerating works with the holy spirit actually bring someone who was who was dead spiritually and makes that person alive regeneration rather than rather than evolution 
One of my final questions for you, Sam, is given the changes that you've been through in business and in life based on, in particular, your your your, your Christianity, what are your aims and ambitions moving forward? Continue continue doing what, doing what I've been doing. Build the company, absolutely. Build and scale my training business. Build and scale my trading capital. Um, and and begin to build a team in in the business as well to help me manage some of these things and to help me scale. But in life, to to be a godly husband to my wife, to be a godly father to my children, and to to serve the Lord with my life as well, I see so many areas, you know, that I think, yeah, that needs that needs improvement there. And by God's grace, it will. I want to. I, I typically I'll read the Bible every year. Um, you know, sometimes I'll maybe do it in six months, sometimes I'll do it in the 12 months. But this year specifically, I, I want to read the New Testament four times. I want to memorize the book of Ephesians. You know, some the, these are just some of the goals I have that people are like, okay. Um, I want to get but it's more- It's where you're at in your journey as well. Yeah, I want to get more into Koine Greek, which is the one of the languages the New Testament was written in and my understanding of of that that Greek language as well because it, it brings out a lot of color in the text and you know that there's we have like you know past tense present tense future tense in greek there's like six tenses and the it's a much more expansive and colorful language the english language although you know we have quite a, a wide um vocabulary it's we have a lot of words that effectively just communicate the same thing and you could use two words that are different and communicate the same thing in a very slightly different way in greek like i mentioned with love phileo agape you have three words to communicate this general idea of love but that mean completely different things almost depends how it's applied yeah okay well sam thank you so much for today i've really enjoyed this from an intellectual perspective from a, a business and mindset perspective i think people will have learned a lot and have challenged some of the things that they thought about including some things that i've thought about as well where should people head towards to continue the conversation with you so I mean I'm on I'm on social media I'm on LinkedIn I'm on Instagram I'm on Twitter I'm on YouTube you know I've built a fairly um, decent YouTube following over the past few years and I share a lot of my life on there you know whether it be business and trading stuff whether it be family stuff even you know us having having our baby that's all I've kind of announced that on YouTube and that so people can people can see a fairly good inside scoop into my life through youtube and instagram brilliant those will be linked in the show notes thank you so much to you the listener i'll be back to speak to you all again very very soon